We humans live in a world with three spatial dimensions. Length, width, and height. But is our curiosity limited to these three dimensions? No. We wonder, what would our world look like if there were more dimensions? We ask, what if there were more than three dimensions? What if instead of three, there were four spatial dimensions? What would our world look like then? What would a cube look like? What would a sphere look like? It is a later question that we will explore in more detail over the course of this video. But there is a problem. Our brains are so used to living in a world with three dimensions that we are unable to fathom what a four-dimensional world would be. However, this is not the end of the story. Although we cannot imagine exactly what our world would look like in four dimensions, that does not mean that we cannot learn anything about a four-dimensional world at all. Today, we are going to find the hypervolume of a hypersphere. But before we get into that, let's go over some definitions. First of all, what is a hypersphere? A hypersphere is the four-dimensional equivalent of a sphere. More precisely, it is the set of points in four-dimensional space that are equidistant from some center point. What about hypervolume? Hypervolume is the analog of volume in four-dimensional space. Just like we have length in one dimension, area in two, and volume in three, Hypervolume is the next step in that ladder that exists in four dimensions. Now that we got those definitions out of the way, let's get started on actually trying to solve this problem. Frankly, it's not so clear how we're going to go about finding the hypervolume of a hypersphere. Besides, we can't even imagine what one looks like. It is in moments such as these where we do not understand how to make progress on a hard problem that we should consider looking at a simpler case that we can understand. Here, that case is trying to consider how to find the volume of a simple sphere. Now you might say that we already know what the volume of a sphere is. It is 4 over 3 pi r cubed, where r is the radius. But the point of looking at the simpler case is to see how did we find that formula, and can we use a similar idea to find the hypervolume of a hypersphere? Well, there are multiple ways to find the volume of a sphere. But the way I'm about to show you is one that will allow us to use a similar method to find the hypervolume of a hypersphere. Recall that the equation for a sphere centered at the origin with a radius of r is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals little r squared. Now, observe what happens if we move the z squared term to the other side of the equal sign. We get x squared plus y squared is equal to small r squared minus z squared. Notice that the left side of this equation is quite similar to that of a circle, x squared plus y squared equals big R squared, except here, big R squared is equal to little r squared minus z squared. This implies that we can think of our spheres as a collection of circles stacked on top of each other if we let the value of z to vary. Let me illustrate that point in a little bit more detail as I understand that it could be a little confusing. Let's look at the sphere that I've graphed here in GeoGebra. It has the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. So that means it has a radius of 2 and it is centered at the origin. Let's look at cross sections of the sphere with planes such as z equals 3 over 2. This cross section is effectively the same as looking at all points on the sphere that have a z coordinate of 3 over 2. If you look at this cross section, you will see that it is indeed a circle. In fact, we can repeat this process with different planes at different z-coordinates, and you will find that in every case, the cross-section is a circle. Let's look at a couple of different planes. For example, z equals 1 half. If we graph that plane like that, then if we draw the cross-section, it is again a circle. Now let's try one more plane. z equals negative 1. There's a plane, and there's the cross-section. Yet again, the cross-section is a circle. Notice that the values of z for this sphere range from negative r to plus r. For example, here, r equals 2 and z ranges from negative 2 to 2. If we vary the z-coordinates from negative r to positive r, we will get circles of varying radii as the cross-sections. If we let each of these cross-sections to have an infinitesimal thickness, dz, then by finding the volumes of each of these little cross-sections and adding them up using an integral, we can find the volume of the sphere. The reason that we need the circles to have this little thickness is because we can't add up area to get volume. 
so each circles need a little bit of height to make it three-dimensional and have a volume that can be added up together. This technically makes them cylinders, but I might also refer to them as circular cross-sections over the course of this video, because in reality that's basically what they look like. They just have a little infinitesimal thickness in the z-direction. So let's do just that. The integral that we're going to use to find the volume of the sphere is the following integral. But let's break that down so that we understand it better. The bounds are negative r to positive r, as those are the values that z can range between. The integrand is the way that it is because the area of each circle is pi times big R squared, and we already said that big R squared is equal to little r squared minus z squared. Finally, the dz term completes the integral and adds the infinitesimal thickness that the circles needed. Now, we can evaluate this integral and see that it does indeed give us the formula for the volume of a sphere that we have always known. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to pull the pi out of the integral since it's a constant. So we end up getting the following integral. Now, we can use the reverse power rule to find the antiderivative of the integrand, and we're going to have to evaluate this antiderivative at z equals r and z equals negative r. Then, we can actually do this computation and find the following expression which simplifies quite nicely down to the formula that we know, v equals 4 over 3 pi r cubed. This is great! We have been able to find a way to find the volume of a sphere. Now comes the fun part, using the method that we just used to find the volume of a sphere to instead find the hypervolume of a hypersphere. This is going to be a little bit more difficult as we don't have any diagrams to help us along the way. However, we should be okay as long as we make sure to repeat the same general steps while substituting three-dimensional things with their four-dimensional analogs. So let's get right into it. If we recall from earlier on in the video, the first thing we did with the sphere case is that we defined an equation for the sphere. It seems like a good idea for us to do this for the hypersphere as well. Well, since the equation for our sphere with radius r is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals little r squared, it makes sense that the equation for a hypersphere with radius little r is w squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals little r squared. Now, here I've added w as another variable for us to use, corresponding to the fourth dimension. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to move the w term over to the right side of the equation, which is similar to moving the z term over as we did during the sphere case. This gives us x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to little r squared minus w squared. Now the left side of this equation reminds us of the equation of a sphere. As we saw earlier, the equation of a sphere with radius big R is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals big R squared. If we compare these two equations, we will notice that they are equivalent if we let big R squared equal little r squared minus w squared. Now just like the sphere case, we can notice that if we let the value of w to vary, we can see that our hypersphere has cross-sections of spheres and can be viewed as being composed of many spheres stacked on top of each other. All of these facts can be combined together so that we can create an integral that we can use to find the hypervolume of a hypersphere. Here it is. Just like we did with the sphere case, let's break down this integral piece by piece. First of all, just like with the sphere, the bounds of this integral are from negative r to r as these are the values that w can take on. You can check this for yourself by noticing that if you put any value of w that is not in this range into our equation for a hypersphere, you will not be able to find any other combination of the other variables such that this equation still holds true. Next, the integrand of this equation deals with the fact that we can break the hypersphere into spherical cross sections with varying radii. The volume of each sphere is 4 over 3 pi big R cubed, and we said earlier that big R squared is equal to little r squared minus w squared. So we can make the substitution in for big R cubed to make the integrand above. Finally, just like in the case with the sphere, we need to give each of these spheres some little thickness in the w direction, which is why we add the dw term. This term also completes the integral. Now. All that is left is to evaluate this integral and get our final answer. First, let's pull the constant 4 out of 3 pi out of this integral. This gives us the following integral. However, this integral is a little bit more challenging to evaluate than the previous one due to the exponent of 3 halves. Because of this exponent, we're going to have to use some trigonometric substitution. 
This kind of substitution makes sense because little r squared minus w squared looks a little bit like 1 minus sine squared theta, which is equal to cosine squared theta by the Pythagorean identity. In particular, the substitution that we're going to use is w equals r sine theta. This means that dw equals r times cosine theta, d theta. We also have to change the bounds of this integral. Here, positive r changes to pi over 2 and negative r to negative pi over 2. We can then substitute this into our integral to get the following. By noticing that r squared minus r squared times sine squared theta is r squared times cosine squared theta, we can then use a form of the Pythagorean identity to continue to simplify this down. After doing all the simplification we can in pulling the r to the fourth term out of the integral, as it is a constant, the integral boils down to finding the area under cos to the fourth of theta from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. This isn't something we can evaluate easily, so we're going to have to use some more trigonometric identities. We will use the Pythagorean identity again by turning cos squared of theta into 1 minus sine squared of theta. And that leaves us with the integral at the bottom. We will then distribute and split this integral into two, one of cos squared theta and one of sine squared theta times cos squared of theta. Let's solve each of these integrals separately and then plug them back into the original expression at the end. First, let's deal with the cos squared of theta integral. We're going to use another trigonometric identity here by writing cos squared of theta in terms of cos of 2 theta. Making the substitution, we get the following integral, which can be evaluated with relative ease. After finding the antiderivative and evaluating it at both of the bounds, our final answer for this part comes out to be just pi over 2. Now, let's deal with the sine squared theta cos squared theta 1. First, we're going to note that sine theta cos theta is equal to sine 2 theta over 2 by the sine double angle formula. The integral then becomes sine squared of 2 theta over 4 from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. It is time to apply another trig identity. This one is of cos 2u like before, but this time we're going to be rewriting sine squared of 2 theta, not cos squared of theta. So once we go through all the uh, rewriting, we will get the final integral as the one on the bottom. This integral can now be evaluated using normal methods. Once we chug through the math that involves computing the antiderivative and evaluating it at both bounds, and then finally going through all the simplification, the final answer for this part comes out to be pi over 8. Finally, let's substitute in the values for both of the integrals that we just did back into our original expression to get our final answer. So that was our original expression. And then the cos squared of theta integral came out to be pi over 2, and the sine squared theta cos squared theta integral came out to be pi over 8. And if we simplify all the things down and let things reduce, we get our final answer of 1 half pi squared r to the fourth as the hypervolume of a hypersphere with radius r. We have now accomplished the goal that we set for ourselves at the beginning of the video to find the hypervolume of a hypersphere. Once again, the formula for this is 1 half pi r squared times r to the fourth, where r is the radius of the hypersphere. If r equals 1 and the hypersphere is a unit hypersphere, its hypervolume is pi squared over 2. Now hopefully you enjoyed doing that and learning more about the hypersphere. If you are interested in finding the higher dimensional volumes of even higher dimensional spheres, then you can use a similar method to the one we used in this video to find the higher dimensional volume of a sphere of any dimension. However, I think the really interesting thing about this topic is that it illustrates how math can be used to solve problems that our brains can't even completely comprehend. I think this is one of the beautiful things about math, and hopefully I've been able to share a little bit of that beauty with you all too. As always, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next video.